recording here. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I think Stephanie, it's also here. Maybe I'll let Stephanie kind of um, kind of uh, host rounds a little bit later as well. But I'll introduce Fahad here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's another speaker and a colleague that Amal works with. Uh, sorry, uh, Fahad works with her well, Amal Verma, uh, who is also an internist at St. Michael's Hospital, who unfortunately cannot uh, come today because um, his, daughter, his daughter is sick. So Fahad uh, is here today. He's just, you know, he is an amazing internist uh, at St. Michael's Hospital. You know, he um, did training in health services research and global health. And one of the projects that they're really working on uh, I know with uh, Mohammed Mandami at the beginning, it's uh, a project uh, entitled the Gemini Project, which is really one of the hospital launch, hospital uh, research network in Canada that link a lot of internal medicine data with big data. Uh, Fahad has a biomedical engineering degree, MD degree uh, at University of Toronto. Uh, he was one of the fellows at Harvard that did postdoc training at big data, social determinants health and things like that. So he uh, really, it's uh, one of the great um, early researchers. He's got more than you know, $700,000 in salary award, more than $20 million in funding, and it's been really well published. And, you know, one of the things that you may know about him is that he's been on the COVID science table, that he's been involved in a lot of decisions about COVID vaccines and things like that. So uh, really look forward to... Uh, hearing about Fahad talk today about big data, using big data to improve uh, quality of hospital care, which is one of the important things that we, you know, in a cardiology world, uh, we have been really a lot of interested. We've been, you know, in, in quality of this, quality improvement business for a long time. So really thanks a lot, Fahad, for, for coming. So maybe next time we'll, we'll have you and Amal come up uh, as well to talk about it, maybe in the near future. So thanks a lot, Fahad. Uh, thanks, Dennis, for the super kind introduction thing, and thank you to all of you for having us today. Um, it's a real delight to, to share our work, which is the work of a large network of hospitals, really. And uh, and for me, especially to give rounds at Sunnybrook is really a sweet uh, thing to do because it was my first uh, place that I ever rotated as a resident. So it was Sunnybrook Hospital on July 1st of my residency. So great to be back and presenting some of our work. Uh, so I am not going to talk about COVID today. <laughs> we our, our platform and our team has done a lot of work during COVID. Um, uh, we looked at uh, we uh, looked at uh, the we published a larger study on hospitalizations with COVID. We looked at critical drug shortage with tocilizumab, um, the change in hospital operations, etc. Um, but you know it's really nice to think about things other than COVID, obviously. And uh, we have been working on quality improvement work for the last five years uh, by building the platform and then starting to apply it over the last couple of years. And would love to share that work. And it's actually a lot of the areas that we're trying to focus now on getting up and running again now, hopefully as the pandemic hits another stable point. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about our data platform, our work on physician quality reporting. Um, and I'm going to give three select quality improvement applications. One is on echocardiograph use in stroke. The second is on PICC line usage, um, and the third is on delirium. Um, I'm happy to answer questions anytime or at the end. I'll leave it to Dennis to decide about the, about the question answering, but please um, write things in the chat room or tell Dennis and, and, and just prompt me because I'm not going to be looking at the chat box as I'm speaking. Yeah, Fahad, I think it's probably best to maybe pause if you have different segments to pause. We can just get everybody to kind of just speak up a little bit. Just that pauses. Yeah, that'll be, I think usually that works best. Sounds great. And the physician quality reporting section is where I've spent the most time. Uh, and I have an ex example of a report and things that I'll go through. And so I, I think there'll probably be a number of questions in that section would, would really appreciate them and love to take. Okay, so our uh, vision is to use hospital data and analytics to accelerate research and to improve quality of care uh, for uh, patients. And our focus really has been harnessing um, existing data. So our goal has been saying, if you have patients admitted to hospital and you generate incredible volumes of data, the lab tests, the imaging tests, the medications you're prescribing, can we figure out a way to get all of that data out of hospitals and to use that for research and for quality improvement. So a lot of our work has been figuring out how to collect and harmonize that data. We've worked in general medicine about starting to provide clinically meaningful quality metrics for physicians. 
Um, and we're working a lot in big data and advanced analytics. We work with groups like the Vector Institute um, with Mohammed, as Dennis mentioned. Um, we started as a general medicine focused initiative, but as I'm gonna describe, uh, we now include all hospitalized medical patients. So cardiology ward admissions, respirology ward admissions, and the intensive care unit. That's been our shift over the last year. And so our goal now is to really talk more about the hospitalized medical patient rather than just a general medicine ward patient. And that was a really important transition for us because as we were starting to write our initial papers and write our grants, um, as we were submitting them to higher tier journals or getting um, feedback back from grant reviewers, a lot of what they were saying is this great, great initiative, great that you're linking data, but if you care about individual diseases, if you care about a heart failure admission, if you just look at the general medicine ward, you're not considering all heart failure admissions. You're missing, importantly, the fact that heart failure admissions also go to cardiology wards and they also go to the intensive care unit. If you just look at COPD on a, on a medicine ward, you're missing the COPD that goes to respirology or to the ICU. And so by just catching one ward, you're missing the disease entity. And so a lot of our work has been to transition to capture now all of the medical uh, ward admissions and the ICU. And that's where we are now. And as we're growing, that's how we'll continue to be. Uh, this is our team. We just, I think we just crossed 30 full-time employees, um, pretty uh, dynamic team. About half of our team are full-time data scientists. The other half have project management, uh, epidemiology, or quality improvement expertise, um, mainly based at Unity Health with about five employees at Ontario Health. Okay, so our data comes in from hospitals. And as I mentioned, we now uh, bring in all medical data in the ICU. We've uh, just crossed 33 hospitals in the network. So we, we started at seven Toronto area hospitals, um, St. Michael's, Toronto Western, Toronto General, Sunnybrook, Mount Sinai, and uh, the two Trillium hospitals. Over the last two years, we've started the process of extending out our data sharing agreements and our, and our REB agreements out to all of the academic health sciences centers in the province, plus most of the large community hospitals. And that covers approximately 60% of Ontario's um, medical ward beds are now contained in Gemini. We've worked a lot towards building a state-of-the-art high-performance computing environment for, for our researchers um, and analysts to use. We hold our data at the HPC for Health <coughs> cloud platform. And, and this took a lot of work to, to um, work with hospital privacy officers and legal uh, offices to make sure that they felt comfortable with this model. So the HPC for Health platform, for those of you who haven't heard of it, is based at SickKids hospitals. It's a virtual cloud-based computing platform, which is scalable, which means that uh, if you are running an intensive machine learning um, algorithm on it, more computing resources will shift towards you to help support running that algorithm versus if you're someone like me who is most comfortable running prevalences and tables and simple regressions. So it'll scale to your needs. Um, other groups that use the HPC for Health uh, platform include UHN, um, ICS has some of their data on it, and CHEO. So other large groups use it as well, and we've, we've migrated a version of our data onto this platform. Importantly, what it means is that historically to use this kind of data, you would have to go to the place where the data is held because it contains highly sensitive patient information and you'd have to work behind their firewall. So historically, if you had to use uh, data like this, you'd have to come to Unity Health and work on one of our computers or you'd have to be at an ICS cluster and work within their firewall. Um, you no longer have to do that. So you could be sitting at Sunnybrook in your office and you could port into our data and use it remotely. Um, it's a complex data environment, but it, 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 it greatly liberalizes the access difficulty. So our goal was to have something that people in Thunder Bay could use just as easily as people at St. Michael's. Um, we have uh, more than 100 scientists who are actively using the data now. Um, more than 75 students have used it as their core trading project. And there's 25 active grants now that are running off of Gemini data. So where does the data come from? So we used uh, the rich administrative data backbone that we have in this province. Um, so the uh, chi high fields, as you know, are generated, are mandatory for all hospitalizations. Um, they tell you about the patient 
um, and are important for understanding health services delivery. So they're the core of a lot of the work that ICS does. Um, they tell you the most responsible discharge diagnosis. They tell you the comorbidities, the age, the length of stay of the patient, et cetera. Um, that's the blue box in the top left corner that I've indicated. Our work has really been focused on the pink boxes. So um, how do you get this other data, which is really valuable out of hospital data systems and standardize it? So the admission discharge transfer system is uh, data that tells you, it's sort of the routing and operational software of the hospital. It tells you what room the patient was in, uh, when they were moved to the CT scanner, when they came back, the time that ICU transfer happened. It can be really valuable for understanding things like who the MRP was at any, at any time. Was the patient near a window? Um, because we were interested, for example, in delirium rates, and we know that delirium um, is affected in some ways by uh, um, availability of natural light. Um, lab data means every lab test that's sent, so uh, hemoglobin, sodium, but also rarer and weirder things like um, an ASPEP or a UPEP, um, if someone sends a, a pheochromocytoma workup. Um, radiology uh, test means the radiologist report, not the imaging file. So we wish we held the imaging file, but what we have is actually the report, which could then be processed by things like natural language processing. So CT scans, MRIs, X-rays, et cetera. Um, that also includes um, our uh, echocardiogram reports, which we also capture. Um, transfusion medicine means whether the patient received blood transfusions, platelets, albumin, et cetera. Pharmacy is all the medications that are given, the, both the, the kind of medication and the, and the dose and the route. So IV furosemide and the route, for example. Uh, IV furosemide and the dose, for example. Uh, vitals, uh, if a hospital has electronic vital signs, we capture them. And then clinical documentation, we're just in the process of working through that. Um, that includes um, the admission and discharge, trans uh, discharge notes. And hopefully in the future, we'll include things like physician notes and nursing notes. I see a chat box has, uh, uh, that's status. Okay, perfect. So we bring that data in centrally into our uh, platform. We go through a lot of uh, data checking, quality, cleaning, harmonization work, and then we transfer it into our centralized data, uh, data holding. As of today, we hold data from eight, eight hospitals um, and over 450,000 admissions. And as you can imagine, that's a lot of data because we're talking about every single data point that has come into a hospital for these, that has been generated in hospital uh, for these patients. We've done a lot of work in validation. So last year we published a paper where we took uh, just over 23,000 data points randomly selected from our database. Um, this represents uh, just over 7,400 admissions. And the reason we went to these great lengths is because one of the things we were told by uh, not only frontline physicians, but researchers and quality improvement experts was these initiatives to extract hospital data have been done many times in the past. Gemini is obviously not the only group that's tried it. And often they're done poorly. So hospital data infrastructure is not well designed for extractions. And so when you're trying to get every single lab test that's ordered, a lot of mistakes can occur. I'll give you an example. When we were doing extractions at one of our hospitals, they changed the symbol for um, one of the electrolytes for sodium. They changed the symbol from N to NA. And the hospital's own uh, IT department, when they did the extraction, re read the NA as data missing rather than the um, periodic table symbol for sodium. And so suddenly an entire... Uh, uh, column of data, months and months worth of sodium values disappeared in their transfer. That's just one example of hundreds I could give you where during the extraction process, things go wrong. And so a lot of what we do is statistical quality control processes to check the data once it's transferred to ensure high quality. But even then mistakes can occur. So we went through this validation exercise. So what we did is we randomly selected just over 23,000 data points. We sent someone into each of the hospitals. We didn't know what was in the Gemini database. They logged into the electronic health record. So at St. Mike's, that electronic health record is called Sorian. It could be Epic. It could be Cerner, depending on the hospital you're in. They then wrote down into an Excel data file the values that they were seeing on this randomly selected patient population. They sent those data back to our Gemini analyst who compared them against our extracted data holdings. And the values that we got for the agreement were between uh, accuracy were between 98 to 100%. So through this statistical process that we've developed, we've hit the point now where we have relatively high accuracy in our data holdings. 
That's important because it means that when we start to generate physician reports or hospital reports, that they're actionable. You don't have to worry as much about the data quality. You can now worry about, so what do I do with this data? Okay, so with that introduction, I'm gonna move on to our physician practice report uh, initiative. So one of the important things that we've exploited is, uh, is an effect that's been described in the literature previously by other health services researchers called pseudo-randomization. And it's the idea that when a patient comes into hospital um, and they're sick, and there's really very little discretion about whether they have to be admitted. Uh, the emergency room doctor sees them, they say, okay, this patient's really sick, they call general medicine or they could call cardiology depending on where the patient's headed and say, okay, this patient needs an admission. And then if you're the staff physician who's on call overnight um, and the patient is uh, sick, you admit them. And because we do call different nights, you know, I may be on one week and then Amal Verma is on the next week and someone else is on the week after, we start to have some statistical balance in the kind of patients we're seeing within a hospital. So the, the patients walking in the door at St. Michael's are very different than the patients walking in the door at Sunnybrook. But us as internists at St. Michael's, we're seeing a relatively balanced population as long as we do the same kind of care. So at one hospital, you may have someone who only does post-stroke care. Okay, they have a different practice. But if you're a generalist working on a medicine ward, this assumption of what's described as pseudo-randomization holds up pretty well. Um, we've, we've looked at this statistically. This is a paper we published on this, along with uh, looking at, at variation in, in clinical practice. But the idea itself of you know, randomization, as I said, we're not, we're not the only group to use that idea. Um, it would hold equally well for the intensive care unit. It would hold equally well for many general cardiology wards or CCUs. It would hold equally well for a general surgery ward. So anywhere where you are not electively admitting patients, this idea holds pretty well. It does not hold well for elective surgery. So one of the previously observed phenomena is that if you take elective surgical procedures, let's say hip or knee replacements, um, pre previous literature has shown that the best surgeons, so let's say the surgeons who are considered the most technically skilled, will often have the worst outcomes. Why is that? It's because the best surgeons, we think, are often referred the most complex patients. They're the ones who are referred patients that no one else will operate on. Um, they're the ones that their colleagues will send the highly comorbid knee replacement with the blah, 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 blah. So in, 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 that, in those fields, looking at physician differences in practice has often been hampered by case mix differences. The fact that the physicians, individual physicians are seeing big differences in the types of patients they're seeing. The argument here is that you can start to do direct physician comparison within hospitals because you don't have to worry about that phenomenon because of pseudorandomization. What it doesn't allow, however, is direct comparison of um, myself at Unity versus, let's say, Dina Weinerman, who's a close colleague of ours at Sutterbrook. So this, as I mentioned, this is a paper that we uh, kind of describe, and we statistically tested this, I think, seven different ways um, in a general medicine population to see whether it was accurate. And we found that this phenomenon of pseudorandomization was very accurate. Okay, in order to generate these reports, we did a few other things. Um, we kept um, admissions with the same admitting discharge and chi high MRP. So the idea here is that um, in general medicine care, and I think this is true for ward-based cardiology care, um, we work in shifts. We work in seven-day um, cycles or 14-day cycles, and then we hand over care of a patient to someone else. So if you had a patient admitted on a Monday to me and I handed over care Tuesday to Amal, and the patient died on Wednesday, how do you attribute that death? Who does it get attributed to? Is it me as the admitting physician on Monday? Is it Amal who took over on Tuesday because the patient died on Wednesday? Um, that attribution challenge has really hampered quality rep reporting on general medicine. And so when we spoke to our colleagues, one thing that everyone seemed to coalesce around was the idea of using patients which are admitted and discharged by only one staff physician, okay? So if I'm on for a two week block of service, these are the patients that I both saw, cared for, and admitted during my block. Um, it obviously reduces sample size, so you bias towards a shorter length of stay group of patients. But what it does remove is the attribution um, difficulties. 
And in the, as we're growing our program in our reports, we're, we're gonna be introducing an ability for individual physicians to toggle and to see what their report would look like if they used all patients that they saw. So every patient they're a chi high MRP on or only this narrow data set where they're the, where they're the only staff physician. Um, today, I'm gonna to share the first because that's when we, when we shared this work with our colleagues across the country, they seem to greatly prefer using this pure attribution model where, we, where they're the only MRP involved. They, they wanted that when they got physician reporting because they found the interpretation to be a lot clearer if no other staff physician was involved in care. Um, for statistical stability, we only kept physicians who had more than 100 patients. That's not hard if you do based care. And we removed admissions with a length of stay greater than 14 days for the reason that I mentioned, part uh, for this MRP reason. Uh, maybe can I uh, maybe possibly can I ask something about the um, a physician report? So we've done this for cardiology for some time. So we used to report for um, core health. Um, the physician comparison of PCI report card, bypass report cards. And as, as you know, like the early days of bypass report cards, you know, you've identified a lot of people with like outliers and they, those surgeons, you know, turned out not to be working kind of soon because they weren't even, you know, cardiac surgeons. So when you kind of do these report cards, one of the comments is that, well, you know, my, my case is a lot more complicated than yours. And that's really been the, um, I don't know whether it's an excuse or something that they say, like they always have a sense that their cases are more complex, but is that really the case in other setting? I just worry that that's, you know, a risk adjustment and case complexity, it's been always the way the, all the, the comments uh, that physicians have. I'm not really sure if that's true in all, all conditions. Yeah, um, great question. This is the, uh, the heart of the pseudo randomization work that we did, which is that, um, I think what you're describing in, I don't know the, um, I, I, I have read about this, but I, obviously it was before we started this work, the cardiac surgery reporting literature that you're describing, which is this exact problem, which is this elective um, surgery problem where um, individual cardiac surgeons could have very different case mixes because they're being referred very different patients because they're known to do either, you know, this kind of surgeon or that kind of surgeon, they refer different cases. Because we're dealing with hospitalized patients here who are non-electively admitted, we uh, feel pretty confident that this pseudo-randomization phenomena exists, which flattens the case mix differences. And we've gone through a lot of exercises with our colleagues to convince them this. Like, for example, we would, in early days, we would plot, uh, we would show for a, div a division, let's say it's St. Mike's, we would show the average age, sex, severity of admission, um, et cetera, baseline characteristics of the patients who are admitted for each staff physician, but we wouldn't put the physician's name on. So we would just put up 15, um, uh, a, you know, let physician A through physician K, and we would show the average age, sex, severity of admission, et cetera, time of admission. And we would tell our colleagues, can you figure out who you are? And everyone would agree that as they looked across the 15 names they had, they looked identical, like the numbers looked identical. In our reports themselves, I'll show you, we actually give physicians the ability to look at their numbers relative to their colleagues to help convince themselves that they are not seeing different patients. And after we, we've gone through now two cycles of this kind of reporting, after doing it, we haven't recently, we're not getting physicians saying to us at all that they think their patients are different. Um, as I said, there's a couple of examples, like a couple of our hospitals have a stroke unit and there's visit general internists who essentially do post-stroke care clearly their patients are different. So in this case, we're talking about the general medical ward, the CTU, et cetera. The one, the, the one other thing that I'll mention is that one of the frequent questions we get is about the resident effect. So especially if you're in a teaching unit, resident or, or medical student effect, especially if you're in a teaching unit, um, like St. Mike's or Sunnybrook, a lot of the decisions on ward-based care are made by trainees before a staff physician is involved, right? It's the trainee overnight who orders the initial admission blood work. It's the trainees in the daytime on the on the, on the team who are ordering a lot of the tests or the or the or the medications. So there was a concern early on by the staff physicians saying, well, look, if you're going to show us that we have big differences in our practice patterns, well, it's the residents, it's the medical students. I don't control a lot of what's what's being done. That's that's a really um, uh, interesting uh, um, concern about this because if you think about the way that our training programs work, trainees flow 
across training programs. So the, 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 the resident that I have on CTU next week when I go on service is someone else's resident a month from now, right? The medical students stay on this block and they move on to this block and they're elective students. The thing that stays on an individual team is the staff physician when they are on their block on service. So if anything, trainees should dilute the differences between staff physicians. Imagine that one staff physician is a really heavy prescriber of broad spectrum antibiotics and another staff physician almost never uses them, but trainees use them at an average rate. If the trainees are flowing between the staff physicians, it should dilute the differences between staff physicians. So in other words, the differences that I'm gonna show you are probably even larger if the trainees weren't involved. The trainees are almost a normalizing effect on the staff physicians. The second thing that I'll say is, and I show these reports, it'll, it'll make a bit more sense. Staff physicians can greatly shape the way that trainees practice. That's the whole point of medical education. You can do a lot to affect the ways that trainees will care for patients. And that's part of what is potentially actionable from this data. Okay, so with that introduction, let's see how big the differences are. So um, A through G are the first seven hospitals that participated in our program. In this plot, we're looking at length of stay. Um, and on the y-axis, we have total length of stay. And on the x-axis, we have um, the physicians. Um, each individual bar in a letter represents one of the physicians. So look, let's look at A, for example. Let's say that that's St. Michael's Hospital. Within St. Michael's Hospital, each of those bars represents one of the staff physicians. Okay, So one of those bars is me, one is Vera, one is Amal, one is Ophir Murad, et cetera. Um, remember now that we have pseudo randomization. So your, your eye is already starting to look at the fact that in, ho in hospital A, you're seeing a pretty steep gradient in length of stay between physicians. 4.9 is the average. So the average length of stay for our patients is 4.9 at St. Michael's. 1.7 is the spread. And again, I'm just theoretically saying A is St. Michael's. A could be Sunnybrook, but just as an example, okay? 1.7 is the 10th to 90th percentile spread. All right, so first thing that you should notice here is that even though the average is 4.9, there's a staff physician at St. Michael's at Hospital A who has an average length of stay of just over three and a half days for their patients. There's an other who has an average length of stay of about 5.75 days. So just by virtue of who you're admitted to overnight when you come in and get admitted at this hospital, you could have a two day difference in your length of stay on average as a patient. Second, second thing, is this real? Uh, is this uh, difference in hospital A unusual or is it typical? If you look across the hospitals now, you'll see the spreads can be enormous. So look at hospital D. This is an academic hospital within the city of Toronto, staffed by the same kind of general internists that work at, at uh, St. Mike's or Sunnybrook. You can have a 2.3 day absolute spread and you can get as big as an over a six day average length of stay versus just over three average length of stay for a patient, depending on who they're admitted to. So we're talking about huge spreads between staff physicians. Are there differences between hospitals? Yes, there are differences between hospitals. So hospitals can be 3.9 uh, like hospital B versus 4.2 versus hospital C. But what is really striking is given that within a hospital, because of pseudo randomization, we're seeing the same kinds of patients, you get these enormous spreads. The second question to ask is, is it statistically real? Is this just noise that we're seeing or is it statistically real? So what we've done here is we've done statistical comparisons by using the bottom uh, quartile of physicians. So the bottom three or four physicians as a reference category. And then we did pairwise comparisons. And because this is a length of stage, just a t-test. If the differences are statistically significant, we left the bars as colored. If they were not statistically significant, we grade the bar out. So if you look at hospital E, you'll see there's a one staff physician right in the middle of the distribution who has a gray bar. That's because they're relatively new in practice, don't have as big of a sample size. The, the difference is not statistically real. But as you look across, you can see the majority of hospitals, these differences are big and they're statistically significant. So they're real differences, okay. Before you think that this is only about physicians, though, look at the um, spread at hospital D, 2.3 days, versus hospital C, 0 0.7 days. So two hospitals, both academic hospitals in the city of Toronto, both staffed by general internists, one hospital has tripled the spread, 2.3, versus another hospital, 0 0.7. 
That's clearly not about physician practice. That's clearly about the hospital itself. So something about the hospital at D allows this enormous spread between physician practice, which is not, which doesn't exist at hospital C. And we think that this is where this, these kind of, this kind of reporting really highlights where hospital level resources or ward level resources can be crucial. In this case, I'll tell you anecdotally that hospital C has a discharge team composed of non-physicians who are experts at the complexity of discharge in Toronto. So they know the shelter number and how to get a late night ambulance and all of this stuff. They take over the discharge process from staff physicians once a patient is medically stable. So every day it rounds to say, is your patient stable? Are they ready for discharge? If you say yes, they then call the nursing home, call the family, they arrange everything. And probably we have to test this as we've now grown to 35 hospitals. That helps to narrow variation between physicians when you have this resource which can take this task that, you know, none of us were trained to be extra expert discharge planners in a complex city, um, can start to narrow variation. So this kind of data provides you some insights about physicians, but it's also important to understand variation uh, uh, between hospital resources. Um, just to now kind of uh, show a couple of other examples, this is 30-day readmission rates. Again, you can see huge differences. If you use um, hospital E as an example, that's an absolute difference in readmission rates of more than 5% um, between physicians, depending on who a patient is admitted to. So these are physicians or care teams. There's a more than 5% absolute difference. So if you use a number needed to harm framework, we're talking about one extra readmission for every 18 patients roughly admitted to that hospital, depending on which physician and care team they're admitted to. So these are, again, pretty big effects. And you can see um, that that spread exists at almost every hospital. So how, what is uh, readmission to GAM? Like, do they have to be discharged from uh, to home? They come back to the hospital and they went to GAM? Is that right? Yeah, this is 30-day readmissions to their ho to, to hospital, um, mm -hmm. where the hospital is in the, in, in the Gemini network. So um, so this means that they were, let's say they're admitted for pneumonia, they're discharged, they come back in, they're admitted for pneumonia at Mount Sinai, they're discharged, and they come back into St. Mike's a week later and are admitted. Um, that's what this is capturing. Or they come back to Sinai or they come back to Toronto General or whatever, and they're readmitted. So you can see, again, there's these pretty big spreads. We're, we're, as we, I'm showing you some of our older indicators, there's been a physician preference to move to shorter readmission windows. So there's some literature to suggest that seven-day readmissions are more controllable by physician action. So our, our latest reports include seven-day readmission numbers. But you can see, again, the, the, big, the spreads are, are quite significant. Yeah, um, I'm just saying that like the remission to GIM may not be a GIM, like it's, it's, it's discretionary from the ED perspective, right? So, you know, some ED would admit everybody who came in last week. Some people say, oh, right. you, you can go. Like, so it's a, it, it's a variation may not be at the, the GIM level. Just my, just when I think about this. I, I agree with you, Dennis. And I think again, what we're probably, the fact that we're seeing a signal um, there's a lot of things that should be diluting this signal. There's the ED discretionary effect. There's, again, trainees or other things which should dilute it. The fact that you can still see um, a signal, this, this spread and this difference between staff physicians, I think suggests that there is a real effect happening here, but there are clearly other effects in the system for the reasons you said um, that can affect this. One of the questions we often get, I'll just mention it, is that, well, what about readmission rate versus length of stay? So maybe physicians who keep their patients in longer will discharge a more stable patient and have a lower readmission rate. And so do you penalize in one direction by trying to move in another direction? Um, for the roughly 200 physicians who are in the first seven hospitals that are part of our network, we ran a correlation. Um, each dot here represents one of the physicians <clears throat> and we correlated their length of stay against their readmission rate. And yet, as you can see, there's no correlation between length of stay and readmission rate. So in other words, you can move one parameter without affecting the other parameter at the physician level. Okay, um, just to quickly say that this kind of data can be used for other kinds of analysis in hospitals. So there was a question at St. Mike's to run team effects. So St. Mike's is organized into four core teaching teams, A through D, team A, team B, team C, team D, and a daytime team called team E. Um, they're staffed with different physiotherapists and different discharge planners and different uh, nurse managers. Is there a difference between these teams? We found that actually there was very little difference. Um, but team E, which is um, a daytime team was seeing very different kinds of patients. Um, they asked us if bed spacing affects care. So for example, if you're admitting a patient to general medicine and they end up on the neurology neurosurgery ward because we've run out of ward capacity, does their care differ? And it does. 
So we found on average that if you take a, a patient admitted to general medicine in their bed space, they, for example, stay in hospital 0.2 days longer. And if you aggregate that over the many tens of thousands of patients seen on general medical wards, this ends up being quite a big effect. Um, all of this data comes in for physicians to help them understand their practice. It's supported by an Ontario health program called the General Medicine Quality Improvement Network, which Amal and I co-lead. And it's a network that's supposed to help uh, physicians with both quality improvement resources and a community of practice to help understand this data. Um, how effective is audit and feedback? This is a systematic review by Noah Iver. So this process of providing data to individual physicians is called audit feedback. How effective is it? Um, this systematic review suggests that you can get about a 5%, 4 to 5% effect on, um, on, on individual parameters of desired practice. So length of stay, blood work use, et cetera, you'll get about a 5%, 4 to 5% effect. Obviously that's not huge, but it is meaningful in context of trying to improve the quality of hospital care. Um, this is what our report actually looks like. So let me just break here and uh, actually show you my report. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions as I'm loading up my report yeah, here. Yeah, let's do that. Eric, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, fantastic uh, talk so far. I'm really enjoying it. But um, And maybe you're just coming to this, but the I, I'm asking at uh, about the notion of correlating uh, things like length of stay with aspects of practice versus what you alluded to is perhaps length of stay may be shorter because a particular physician just knows the system better, knows how to work the system, you know, uh, buys chocolates for someone who's booking the echo <laughs> test yeah. and stuff like that. So, uh, are you able to tease that out? And I'll, I'll just tell you my bias. I have a sense that a lot of difference in length of stay and efficiency of hospital care relates to people's comfort with the system and their ability to, you know, to make it work for their, for their patient's advantage. <clears throat> um, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I, um, I think this is the question that's on a lot of people's minds. So how do you measure, like we're talking about electronic data, which is very crude. How do you measure the soft skills, the interpersonal relationships, the things that we know drive a lot of the um, delivery of care in complex systems like hospitals, where a lot of this is relational? Um, we were uh, funded by CHR last year. So we put in one of our, we put in a project grant to look at um, essentially ethnography. So to have embedded researchers join teaching teams and not these researchers don't know who the quote unquote high performing teams are. And all they do is they observe and they record. And then we will start to collate. So we're just starting this process now and we're still gonna to start to collate their observations about all of these things. Is it the way that you speak to a medical student or a resident that which enhances the collective nature of your team? Is it the buying of chocolates for the nurse manager? Is it the, we don't know. So we're gonna to start to look at this because I think everyone agrees that um, if, you, if you work with your colleagues in a, in a way that enhances that team dynamic, you just work as a unit much more effectively. And, and we don't know specifically what that is, but that's what we're now focusing on. So we see these big differences. The question is why? Maybe it's technical skills. Maybe it's, you know, that you really know how to discharge a patient effectively, but maybe it's a lot of this relational stuff. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that answer and, and the, what you're pursuing now, because I, I think you're, you're on a good track. Um, this is my report. So every physician in our network received one of these reports. I'm showing you my first report. You can see a little bit outdated now. We released it. It was September 2018. Um, we worked a lot towards the process of having physicians comfortable with this kind of reporting. You know, cardiology has led the way in physicians getting reports or data about their care. General medicine, <clears throat> you could speak to some of our senior interns who have been in practice for 30 years. They'd never received a single point of data about their care. And suddenly with this program, we were dumping enormous volumes of data on people. And so we went through a lot of work meeting individual physicians and divisions to talk about how to use this data, how to make it private and protected. So in each individual's um, um, confidential hospital report email, they receive one of these reports from the Gemini statistical team. No other physician saw their reports. Their division director didn't see the report. I didn't see their report. But physicians were open to sharing their reports if they wanted to. And for example, at Sunnybrook, 
all of the general medicine divisions, uh, hot physicians openly share their reports and they give a copy of their report. At that time, it was Steve Shadowitz. Steve Shadowitz would get a copy of their report. They decided that. But at other hospitals, they decided they didn't want to do that. So it was really hospital by hospital decisions. Once you get your report, so here's my report. The six parameters we reported on were three uh, administrative parameters, length of stay, readmission, and hospital mortality. Um, and then three clinical parameters, the kinds of data we can generate. So how much do I, how much imaging do I use, routine blood work and blood transfusions. I can quickly look at my patients. So my patients are the roughly 400 patients that contributed to my report. My division had roughly 15,000 patients that I could use as a comparator. I can quickly scan through and see that the pseudo randomization effect holds, that I'm seeing patients that are roughly the same age on weekends, nighttime admissions, comorbidity level. You can see it's nearly identical to my colleagues, again, to reinforce that I'm not seeing very different patients. I can then see each individual patient category. And this other, don't think that we don't know what it is. It's just, we didn't fill in the dots here because on general medicine, we see a huge variety of cases. But if you actually wanted to see them, <clears throat> you could go here and actually scroll through all the individual different cases that I've seen. <clears throat> and then we go to indicators. So let's say we go to routine blood work use. So here's routine blood work. So 9.5 is my average use of blood work. So I order blood work 9.5 times routine blood work per admission. 9.6 is the average rate used by physicians in my division. 8.5 is physicians in the bottom 25th percentile. Here's me in orange. Here's each of the staff physicians at my hospital and I, I can actually see their values and I can see physicians in the bottom 25th percentile. Here's my trends in usage over time. And here's the staff physicians in the bottom 25th percentile. And then here's broken down by the 10 most common conditions I've seen with further statistical testing. And you'll see stars at pneumonia, dementia. This means that I'm a higher user of blood work on average for a pneumonia admission uh, versus uh, colleagues in my own hospital. Okay, a lot of information here, right? So how do you use this information? So for the first time, suddenly, as a staff physician, I'm getting this enormous amount of information about, in this case, blood work use, but I could also look at imaging use or how long my patients are staying or et cetera, et cetera. The way that we organized this is that we held individual retreats. So the physicians got together with their reports and they um, would at St. Mike's and all the other hospitals have done this, and they would talk about their data and ask their colleagues for why they're different and how they could potentially improve. At St. Mike's, we used a positive deviance approach, <clears throat> which means that physicians at the bottom 25th percentile, we asked them to self-identify, and then people could ask them questions about their practice. And so, for example, with pneumonias, I ended up being a high user of blood work. So I could ask my colleagues, how do you manage a patient when you meet them with the pneumonia? How much blood work do you order? These were the kind of productive questions that we could use, that we could use to help identify the causes of the differences. Um, we found this to be very useful, as did other hospitals. I'm, I'm just in the interest of time, I'm going to quickly move on uh, just to give a couple of other examples of the use of the data, but then I'll take more questions at the end. Okay, so I'm just going to switch back to um, the original slide deck. So that's an example of our reports. So how well did, were they received? So on average, despite there being a lot of anxiety ahead of time, um, we surveyed the staff physicians afterwards. 80% of physicians identified areas they wanted to improve based on the reports. 95% wanted to receive future reports. I should mention that we're doing similar analytics for trainees. We're working with um, Brian Wong at Sunnybrook. We're working at Schiffer Ginsburg at UHN. And what we're hoping for is that Toronto, if you're a trainee within a couple of years, Gemini will provide you with really um, detailed data about the patients that you are seeing, just like now staff physicians get these. If you're a trainee rotating through the University of Toronto, you'll start to get really detailed data about who you're seeing. This could be really useful for things like competence by design. It could be useful for seeing if you've not seen certain acuities or types of cases during your rotation, so you can intentionally go and, and look for patients like that. Um, we've also been funded by the Canadian Cancer Society to start to do this kind of reporting for oncology wards, which we're in the process of developing. And eventually, um, we anticipate that we'll work with physicians from different specialties who are interested in doing this for their areas as well. 
Okay, I'm in the last five minutes, I'm just gonna give a couple of quality improvement applications with the data. Um, when you have this kind of data, it can quickly generate research projects. Um, it can also involve a lot of trainees. This is a project we published in CMAG uh, just over a year ago, so two years ago now. Um, three trainees involved. The question we asked on general medicine awards is, one of the most common conditions we admit is stroke. We often do echoes, our echoes needed uh, for stroke admissions. Um, how often do they change management? Could they be done as an outpatient? It, echoes, of course, have to be done, but could they be done as an outpatient or from rehab? Uh, this is the publication. Um, and so what we asked is we work with some cardiologists and stroke neurologists, and we asked the question, what are the kinds of conditions you would diagnose on, on an echo that would change your management of a stroke at the time of hospitalization? And the examples that they gave us were things like evidence of cardioembolic disease or a PFO. Um, we didn't know how often these findings were actually occurring. So we did a rapid study using Gemini data. We used Sunnybrook Hospital and St. Michael's. Um, just over 1,800 stroke admissions between these two hospitals. And these are non-TPA strokes. We used Gemini data to populate all of the data fields. Plus, we did a targeted chart review for patients to see how often change occurred. So, for example, did they get referred to cardiac surgery? For, uh, uh, did they get referred for a PFO poser surgery, for example? Um, on average, about 70% of patients ended up having an echo in a hospital. And here's what we found. Those echoes were completely normal 86% of the time. <clears throat> the pre-specified outcomes that would change management occurred extremely rarely. And in fact, in this sample, we only found seven examples or 0.6% of the cases where an actual change in management occurred. And that was things like anticoagulation or antibiotics. So in other words, in 99.4% of patients, the use of an in-hospital echo did not change management in hospital. Again, to emphasize that echo, that echo has to be done. It's just a question of, does it need to be done in hospital at the before discharge? And the reason we ask that is on average, getting that echo extended the length of stay in hospital by 2.7 days. And this would be important if, we, um, if we're looking at the balancing effect, which is that you wanna get these patients into rehab, you wanna get them to the stroke rehab center faster to start the rehab process. So this would argue that you could potentially do that safely, get that echo, but get them into rehab faster. Um, it's led to a quality improvement uh, effort um, between the stroke neurologist and the general internist at St. Mike's, which is, use, which is looking to reduce the use of echo in hospital for stroke admissions and defer that echo to an outpatient basis. <clears throat> um, one other example, which I'll quickly mention, and then I, I think I'll wrap up and, and take any questions, which is pick line placement. Uh, we were really interested in pick lines because we use a lot of them on general medicine. This project involves two trainees. Uh, to complete. Um, this is the publication from it. And um, just a general statement about pick line use of so roughly 350 million pick lines are used per year in the United States. They do get complications at a relatively high rate. So about three to 5% will have complications, things like infection or thrombosis. How often do we use them and are they appropriately used was the question we want to answer with Gemini. And they're typically recommended and used for, this is by the MAGIC guidelines from the University of Michigan. They should be used for things like intravenous infusions, patients with difficult venous access or frequent phlebotomy. So we looked at uh, just over 100,000 hospitalizations in Gemini, uh, which included about 3,500 pick line placements. We found the inappropriate use varied from between 13 to 20% across the hospital. So up to one in five pick lines that were placed were being used inappropriately. The most common reason for inappropriate use was use in a patient with advanced CKD, where you anticipate that they're going to have a dialysis catheter very soon. You shouldn't be putting a pick line in them. Other uh, examples include short durations of use, for example, in the ICU. So putting a pick line in, using it for just a couple of days and out it comes. Um, and women and older patients on average were more likely to receive inappropriate pick lines. I think, Dennis, I have one more example, but just uh, in the interest of answering questions, I think maybe I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, this was an AI example for delirium, but I, I think I'd rather uh, answer questions from people. If there's no questions, I'll keep going, but, uh, but if there's any questions, I'll no, stop. I think, uh, I think there are um, uh, quite a few questions. So um, I think Stephanie has a question. Uh, I would like Stephanie... Like, you know, just it's, I really appreciate her uh, getting you to come up to speak to us, which is fantastic. So, Stephanie, you want to go ahead with your question? Do you yeah, want to just sure. uh, maybe Thank pick you so much. Go ahead. Oh, okay. 
thanks so much for for that excellent talk. Like that was just absolutely incredible. Um, the detailed reports that you can uh, do and everything. And my mind was absolutely just racing with ideas as you were talking because um, I'm also uh, vice chair of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society Heart Failure Quality Indicators Working Group. And we've had a ton of challenges in terms of collecting data to report heart failure quality indicators. And as you are aware, I'm sure, um, heart failure patients are taken care of a lot of the time by both cardiology and internal medicine. I'm just wondering, have you ever thought about reporting heart failure quality indicators uh, with this database or registry? Um, we would love to, Stephanie. A uh, short answer is... <laughs> No, there's so many questions that can be answered and we just, we simply don't have the expertise. We would love to work with you. Um, you know, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of data. Um, it could involve IV diuretic use. It could be the number of days of IV diuretics versus oral. You know, there's a, um, there's a, a large that was number. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, so, how, so one of the biggest challenges that we faced in the reporting of heart failure quality indicators uh, was um, reporting of the left ventricular ejection fraction for echocardiogram. So there is no registry or database that captures this um, parameter. And really that's what's critical in determining whether people are utilizing guideline directed medical therapies, because we need to be able to separate heart failure with reduced ejection fraction from preserved ejection fraction or mildly reduced ejection fraction, et cetera, right? So that was the main stumbling block that we came across. And then also uh, the fact that a lot of these databases and registries didn't link in to medication usage, uh, particularly as outpatients, but even as inpatients. So um, I, I don't know if there's any capacity for Gemini to track these things, but yeah, amazing. So that, wow. <laughs> Yes, that would be incredible because we were unable to do any of the above with our national reporting and finding a cohesive way of, I'm sure that, you know, in different provinces, we had ideas that certain registries were able to do that. But in Ontario, we weren't aware of any uh, registry or database that had that capacity. So yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Um, I'm just going to move on. Uh, Fahad, do you mind just like uh, stopping your slide so that we can see everybody? Uh, I think Brad has a question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great talk. I appreciate it. Can you, can you discuss a little bit about the extraction of imaging data, uh, especially from reports, you know, echo, chest x-ray, CTs, et cetera, particularly ones that have re often repeated, are done repeatedly, uh, uh, how you do that and et cetera? Yeah, thanks, Brad. We're, we're just um, working through the process of using our, our imaging reports. So I should just be clear that what we hold is the report. So we hold the radiologist report, but we don't hold the image file. So we don't hold the actual image file of the CT scan. We have the radiologist report from it. Obviously the reports are not standardized. So they're, they're text. They're the dictated text from the radiologist. So we've been working on um, natural language, on text processing methods like natural language processing to, um, to harness that part of our data set. So for some projects like the ECHO project, we had someone, so if you can imagine the way the leverage Gemini data, we have the standardized data for many fields, lab tests, medications, et cetera. Some things we have text reports for, and, and you can do targeted review of those reports. So we actually had um, physicians scan through the reports to look for uh, findings. And sometimes it's already existing fields like ejection fraction. For, um, for other imaging like CT scan, et cetera, we, for example, we have a paper that's about to be published that's trained uh, natural language processing algorithms to look at CT scans that are ordered for PEs um, to see detection rates. And we and those um, natural language algorithms, uh, processing algorithms can work at around a 95% sensitivity on for PE. So my broader answer would be it's text. You have to develop text processing methods for each specific question. Um, and that's the way that this kind of data could probably be used effectively. And so what if they're having multiple studies done, which often happens, right? Yeah, we have all of the studies. So you can use the timestamp to look at the sequence. So imagine that they had three CT scans done in sequence. You could see each of the different CT scans you could either look at them, like they, we have the report in our data sets, you could actually look at the report and see if, if something changed. But because we're holding data on hundreds of thousands of patients, what we're trying to do is to start to train algorithms to process the data. Did I, did I answer your question, Brad? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if yeah, I- Yeah, I mean, I, I, 
I, I understand that the idea of, of looking for language and picking up code, you know, s certain words that appear repeatedly. I just, yeah. um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's interesting that you're doing it. And I want is it, but I guess there are many times like people have like three or four echoes done in a, in a short period of time and, or ECG is done rep repetitively. So I just wonder how you get around all these other issues about besides just picking out the right word that yeah, you, you need. You can yeah. probably pick all of them, right? In your data set, you just grab everything and then you can look at we, them. We, so, yeah, so we, we capture all of those instances. Uh, Brad, are you asking how would we decide which one to use in an analysis? Yeah. Like, yeah. let's say you have four tests. Yeah, a complex problem. I don't have an answer for you. I think there's a lot about clinical decision making we're not going to be able to figure out. Like, if you have four tests done and you want to see the relationship between the use of an echo and some outcome, which one do you choose? Yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, okay. Angela has her hand up for some time. Um, I just want to give Angela a chance to kind of ask a question. Angela, thanks. Morning. Thank you for coming to do this talk. Fantastic. I think this is one of the first talks I've seen about physician performance level data in Canada. I had a two part question for you. One was really, how did you get, um, what were the challenges of kind of doing that level of reporting and how did you get buy-in from your colleagues? Because I don't see this level of data very common for the Canadian healthcare system. I see it more in other countries. And, and it's really the way to try and tackle some of the variation piece. The second question is very different. Um, the variation data is extremely rich in um, health services data. We know there's a ton of variation by whatever practice or procedure or diagnosis between hospitals, but you started to show changes within the hospital and within physicians. Do you have a feeling of how much of that within hospital variations actually due to the hospital processing versus individual performance? Yeah, I'll, so a lot of questions there, Angela. I'm, I, I should mention, Dennis, I'm happy to stay on to answer questions, but I know everyone has clinics and they're working. Yeah, I'll just sounds, that sounds like a great idea. And uh, I think for those who are interested, um, Maybe we can, like, if you don't mind, Fahad, stay on for a couple of minutes. Uh, but for others, thanks everybody for coming. I know it's 8.30, everybody wants to go back to the clinical work, but I really want to appreciate Fahad uh, for doing this for us. Like, obviously, it's just the work is amazing. And I think we all really astounded to uh, just the amount of advancement you've made uh, in the Canadian health system. So thanks a lot, everybody, for coming. We'll see you next week. But for those who want to stay on for a few more minutes, uh, please, please feel free to. And I've included our link. Uh, which has all the information about our data and access, we would love to work with you. Um, we have a lot of mechanisms in place to bring in uh, researchers. Many of the grants that are running and papers are not led by Amol and I, they're led by other researchers using the data. Um, so write me individually or have a look at our website and uh, would love to meet. Um, so Angela, your question about um, about the about how to how did we get physicians to, to agree to this? It took a lot of work. Um, there was a lot of our colleagues who felt very threatened by the idea of individual level physician reporting. A lot of the questions were legal. Um, what happens if, like, what happens if there is a freedom of information request from Toronto Star, which is trying to look at quote unquote bad physicians? How do you protect it? Some of the questions were about privacy. I'm really don't, I, I care about this kind of data. I don't want other people to see it. Who gets access to this data and how do you protect it? So honestly, it was just, it was elbow work. We, we did hundreds of meetings with physicians up over the years where we answered these questions. We were very, we tried to be as transparent as we could about what we could guarantee and what we couldn't. So for example, our data sharing agreements do not allow us legally to share our data with any external entity. That means that we have, we legally do not have the right to give our data to the Toronto Star. Um, what happens if there's a freedom of information request? We had that audited by lawyers, privacy lawyers at hospitals and by Ontario Health. The legal opinion we received was that um, because this data is being used in the spirit of quality improvement, it's protected by quality improvement um, uh, legislation, like mortality and morbidity rounds are protected, for example, um, but it never been legally tested. So they said it should be protected but it's never been legally tested. So you don't know for sure unless it's legally tested. So that's what our answer has been. It should be protected by legislation, it's quality improvement, but honestly, it's never been tested in the court. So I, we can't tell you for sure that, that a legal challenge would fail. Um, 
so anyway, the, my point in giving that example is that for each set of questions, we did our best to answer. And then really importantly, um, an initiative like this can't uh, work if one hospital tries to take ownership over. So the thing that's been a barrier to hospital data sharing is the siloed culture of hospitals. Yeah. And so, you know, here at Sunnybrook, um, Sunnybrook has been a leader of a lot of the Gemini initiatives. Adina Weinerman, who's an internist and director of quality, has pushed forward a lot of the initiatives. There, I was going to give an example of delirium and um, the measurement of delirium on wards using artificial intelligence. The first hospital to roll it out is Sunnybrook, not St. Mike's, even though it's a Gemini data product. So it's this kind of sharing between hospitals, I think, which is required culturally to get this to move forward. Thanks, Fahad. Um, just, can I ask you a quick question? Uh, I know I've been talking to Mohammed about this recently. Uh, you know, getting one of the limitations is that you have Gemini networks, but you don't have, you know, if somebody gets admitted to somebody else, somewhere else, or if you somebody died outside, you don't have those data right now. Like, how do you, like, do you have the ways to kind of go about doing that if in the future? Yeah, so we are um, okay. So we're at by the by within twelve months, we'll have uh, data from the from the thirty five hospitals uh, in Gemini. Um, every person that's admitted to hospital, we hash their um, MRNs, uh, their health card numbers. So everyone has a unique health card number. Most people who are admitted to hospital, like ninety eight percent of people admitted to hospital, have a health card number. 2% of people are not from Ontario or whatever, they don't have a health card number. We convert the health card number into a unique hash number using an encryption algorithm. The idea behind hashing is that you can go in one direction, but you can't go backwards. So we generate a hash number, but that hash number can never be used to regenerate the health card number. So it protects the privacy of the individual. But now if I was admitted at Toronto General a year ago and I get admitted to St. Mike's last week, I have the same health card number. I generate the same hash. And so I, so in Gemini, we can tell that it's the same individual. So we can track individuals through the system by tracking their encoded health card number, the hash number. The second thing is we're linked to ISIS now. So we've just finished the process of linking to ISIS. So within six to 12 months, we're going to start to include the out of hospital data through the ICS linkage, which will allow us to look at medication follow-up or seeing their specialist after discharge or things like that. Things right now that we can't do because right now we're limited to just in hospital data. Oh, okay. Uh, anybody else? Um, I know Mina has a question, but I don't know whether you want to ask this about the data and things. Um, yeah, hi, thank you so much for how I really appreciate it. I wondered if that link was to answer my question, the one that you put in the chat. Um, I just wanted to know how physicians can, um, if you have a project, um, how do you access the date? Like, is there a proposal process and, and what are the costs associated with uh, You gave a lot of nice examples where trainees were involved in projects. How is this all funded? and? Do we have to, obviously, I would imagine we have to bring our own money to pay for these um, projects, yeah? So there's a number of mechanisms. So the, the first is in terms of use of the data, um, we consider ourselves to be um, stewards of the data. And the, there's a data access committee, which has representation from every hospital in the network. Um, which includes uh, co-investigators. So for Sunnybrook, the, the lead is Adina. Um, at Toronto General, it's Lauren, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As a project proposal is submitted, so on the website that I've linked here, it's a one-page proposal. It's just a text proposal that says, I want to look at, using Stephanie's example, I want to look at heart failure admission quality indicators. Um, here's the indicators that I'm proposing to look at. That proposal goes to our publications committee. We have a turnaround time that we have been able to hold of 10 business days to approve a project. And the goal of the publications committee is just to make sure that you're not doing something that's outside of our RED. And so I should mention everything that I've described is covered um, by a centralized RED, which is focused on looking at the quality and outcomes in hospital care. Um, that has covered about 95% of our projects. In specific examples, people want to do additional chart review. They write their, an additional REB. But in general, projects that are proposed to us are covered by existing REB. So you don't have to generate a new REB. This publications committee adjudicates the proposal and make sure it matches our REB parameters. And they actually sign off on that so that we have a written record to say our REB conditions have been met. Um, once it's approved, 
there's two ways that analysis can happen. One is um, if you want to, um, if you have an analyst on your team who is able to work in a complex data environment, typically someone who has a graduate degree, either master's or PhD in biostatistics, um, we can give them remote access to Gemini and they can run the analysis themselves, okay? I should mention that um, it's, it's a very complicated data set. So I'm an engineer and I have a graduate degree in, in biostatistics. I cannot use this data set because it's huge complex data set. So typically the people who are using it are full-time data scientists or um, people write grants with us and they buy analyst time within Gemini uh, or groups, uh, investigators will ask if they can buy out some analyst time from an existing Gemini analyst. Like I wanna do a project, um, we estimate the number of hours and they buy out time. So three models, either they have their own analyst who works on it remotely or they write a grant or they just have some funding aside and they wanna buy analyst time for someone who's already on the team. Um, and um, we typically, Amal and I, or one of the other investigators, will work with any uh, PI who wants to use the data just to help them understand the data. So if someone had a specific interest in quality at Sunnybrook, you may work with Adina. If it's something about analytics, you may, may work with me, depending on the interest of the person who's uh, proposing the project. Just someone who knows the data set well. Great, thanks. Uh, maybe yeah, that's great. Anybody has one last question? We'll take one more question and we'll let Fahad go. I know he's pretty busy as well. Anybody? If not, um, thanks Fahad. Like, we'll, uh, I'm sure the cardiology group would love to work with you on something. I think uh, we've, I know like we've chatted a little bit in the past with Andrew Ann at St. Mike's and then we just haven't really known enough about the data set. So maybe at some point uh, we'll just kind of talk a bit more, but it sounds fantastic. So thanks a lot, everybody, for coming. Thanks a lot, Fahad. Thank for you so much for coming. Great. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks.